The Hoover Dam stands 726 feet tall in Black Canyon, straddling the border between Nevada and Arizona, and behind it sits a reservoir so enormous it took six years just to fill with water. When construction finished in 1935, this was the highest dam ever built, the first man-made structure to exceed the masonry mass of the Great Pyramid of Giza, and the beginning of Lake Mead, which stretches 110 miles upstream and holds nearly 29 million acre-feet of water at full capacity. Before any of this existed, there was only a violent river cutting through a canyon where summer temperatures regularly exceeded 120 degrees Fahrenheit and annual rainfall amounted to just 4 inches. The Bureau of Reclamation called it one of the hottest and driest regions in the United States. Building here meant moving an entire river, pouring enough concrete to pave a highway from San Francisco to New York, and convincing thousands of men to work in conditions that killed dozens before the dam itself was even started. The Colorado River ran 1,400 miles from the Rocky Mountains to the Gulf of California, and its behavior changed dramatically with the seasons. Winter flows might measure 2,500 cubic feet per second, but summer floods could explode that number to 100,000, and the historical peak recorded in 1884 reached an almost unimaginable 384,000 cubic feet per second. Disasters followed this unpredictability. Between 1905 and 1907, the river broke through canal headgates in California's Imperial Valley and ran uncontrolled for two years flooding over 100,000 acres and accidentally creating the Salton Sea at a cost exceeding $3 million to contain. Another catastrophic flood in 1916 sent water four feet deep through the streets of Yuma, Arizona, and that's when the growing cities of the American Southwest demanded action. Los Angeles needed reliable water. Imperial Valley farmers needed consistent irrigation. Everyone downstream needed protection from floods capable of wiping out entire communities. The answer required a dam of unprecedented scale, one that could store enough water to regulate the river for years while generating electricity to pay for its own construction. Bureau of Reclamation studies of potential dam sites dated back to 1902, and in 1918, Agency Director Arthur P. Davis proposed building in Boulder Canyon. Survey teams spent years exploring the region, and engineer walker Brig Young led one of them to a discovery that changed everything. Nearby Black Canyon offered better accessibility, a more solid foundation, shallower depth to bedrock, and greater reservoir capacity, while Boulder Canyon had geological faults that made it unsuitable. December 21, 1928 brought congressional authorization when President Calvin Coolidge signed the Boulder Canyon Project Act, keeping the Boulder Canyon name despite the site change, because all the prior legislation had used it. President Herbert Hoover declared the act effective on June 25, 1929, and the groundbreaking ceremony took place on September 17, 1930. Secretary of the Interior Ray Lyman Wilbur announced that day that the structure would bear Hoover's name, honoring the president who had chaired the Colorado River Commission and negotiated the interstate compact, making the project possible. A consortium called Six Companies, Incorporated won the construction contract formed specifically for this project by bringing together some of the most experienced firms in the West. Henry J. Kaiser and W. A. Bechtel Company joined McDonald & Kahn, Utah Construction Company, Morrison Knudsen, J. F. Shea Company, and Pacific Bridge Company. Their winning bid came in at $48.90.95, missing the government's confidential estimate by just $24,000. The man they chose to run operations was Frank Crow, Known throughout the industry as Hurry Up Crow, after spending his entire career building dams for the Bureau of Reclamation. Standing six feet six inches tall, wearing his trademark pressed white shirt and large Stetson hat, he lived by a personal motto he repeated often, which was never my belly to a desk. He wanted to be on site watching every detail, and this project represented what he called a wonderful climax, the biggest dam ever built by anyone, anywhere. Crow designed a sophisticated overhead cable system capable of delivering concrete anywhere in the canyon. At peak operation, buckets arrived every 78 seconds, while crews placed over 10,000 cubic yards of concrete in a single day. One worker later recalled that Crow was not only an engineering genius, but a people genius as well. Las Vegas sat 30 miles away and was known for gambling and vice, 
which meant the government wanted workers housed somewhere they could control. Boulder City rose from nothing starting in December 1930, designed by urban architect Sacco Rienk de Boer in what was called the first fully developed experiment in new town planning in the 20th century. At its peak, the town housed over 4,000 workers in 1,500 buildings where alcohol was banned, gambling was prohibited, and city manager Sims Ely held what contemporary accounts described as all legal, moral, and judicial power. But here's the thing about Boulder City. It wasn't ready when workers started arriving in 1931. Thousands of men desperate for work during the Depression camped in a makeshift settlement called Ragtown, about a mile from the dam site, where there was no fresh water, no sanitary facilities, and no shade. Canyon floor temperatures reached 130 degrees that summer. More than 25 people died from heat and related causes in June and July of 1931 alone. And one worker's daughter later remembered watching men swarming over the whole place like a hill of ants. Moving the Colorado River out of the way became the first major engineering challenge. Workers dug four massive tunnels through the canyon walls, two on each side, to carry the river around the construction site. Each tunnel measured 56 feet in diameter during excavation and was lined with concrete to a finished diameter of 50 feet, stretching nearly three miles combined. The work inside those tunnels was brutal beyond description. Temperatures reached 140 degrees, while gasoline-powered trucks filled the passages with exhaust fumes. Workers described colleagues being hauled out like cordwood after being overcome. November 14, 1932 marked success when the river was finally diverted through the Arizona tunnels. Now the real work could begin. June 6, 1933 saw the first concrete go into the dam, launching an engineering operation unlike anything attempted before. The dam contains 3.25 million cubic yards of concrete, and if it had been poured as a single mass and allowed to cool naturally, curing would have taken 125 years. Heat generated during the curing process would have caused dangerous cracking throughout the structure. So engineers embedded 582 miles of one-inch steel pipe throughout the concrete to circulate cold water and draw heat away. A refrigeration plant on site produced 1,000 tons of ice every single day and the entire dam cured in roughly two years instead of a century and a quarter. Construction proceeded in 215 interlocking columns, like giant building blocks where each pore was limited to five feet of height every 72 hours. Adjacent columns locked together with vertical and horizontal keys, creating a unified mass weighing more than 6.6 .6 million tons. The base measures 660 feet thick, roughly the length of two football fields, while the top narrows to just 45 feet across a crest stretching 1,244 feet from one canyon wall to the other. 96 industrial fatalities appear in the Bureau of Reclamation's official records, and the first death came on December 20, 1922, when surveyor J.G. Tierney drowned during early site investigations. What nobody expected was that the last recorded death would be his son, Patrick W. Tierney who fell from an intake tower on December 20th, 1935, exactly 13 years to the day after his father died. Falling objects killed more workers than anything else. Men began coating cloth hats with coal tar and letting them harden for protection. And bureau records note that several workers were hit by falling rocks hard enough to break their jaws, yet didn't receive skull fractures. Six companies eventually contracted for commercially made hard hats making Hoover Dam the first major construction project to mandate them. A persistent myth claims workers are buried in the concrete, but that's completely false. Concrete pours rows only five feet at a time, with each bucket raising the level just two to six inches, while five or six workers watched every pour. A body would have created a structural flaw that engineers would never have permitted. Dennis McBride, director of the Nevada State Museum has stated it plainly. There are absolutely no bodies buried in the Hoover Dam, ever. May 29, 1935 saw the last concrete placed, completing the dam more than two years ahead of schedule and under budget. Six companies netted approximately $8 million in profit, and Frank Crow received a bonus of $350,000.
President Franklin D. Roosevelt dedicated the dam on September 30th, 1935, before a crowd of approximately 10,000 people, standing in 102 degree heat. His prepared remarks began by describing the transformation of the site, calling it an unpeopled forbidding desert 10 years earlier, where a turbulent, dangerous river flowed through a gloomy canyon, with walls rising more than a thousand feet. But Roosevelt opened with words that weren't in his prepared text. Looking out at what had been accomplished, he said he came, he saw, and he was conquered, as everyone would be who sees for the first time this great feat of mankind. He called it the greatest dam in the world and an engineering victory of the first order, telling the workers simply, well done. Water began collecting behind the dam on February 1st, 1935, and Lake Mead, named for Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner Elwood Mead, started its slow growth toward capacity. More than six years would pass before it approached full. Everything in the water's path disappeared beneath the surface. St. Thomas, Nevada had been founded by Mormon pioneers in 1865 and housed some 500 residents at its peak. Hugh Lord was the last man to leave, and on June 11, 1938, he set his house on fire and rode away as water lapped at the buildings. The post office had remained open until just days before. July 30, 1941 marked the moment Lake Mead reached 1,120 feet in elevation, measuring 580 feet deep and stretching 120 miles upstream. The wasteland had become an inland sea. Four billion kilowatt hours of electricity flow from Hoover Dam annually, serving 1.3 million people across California, Nevada, and Arizona under power contracts extended through 2067. Tourism brings approximately 7 million visitors to the area each year, and the dam holds recognition as both a national historic landmark and one of America's seven modern civil engineering wonders. Sculptor Oscar Hansen installed a terrazzo floor at the dedication showing the northern hemisphere sky as it appeared at 8.56 p.m. on September 30, 1935, designed as a 26,000-year cosmic clock allowing future astronomers to calculate the date from stellar positions. Lake Mead currently sits at roughly 35% of capacity, more than 160 feet below full pool, a victim of the worst drought in Chow 200 years. The white bathtub ring circling its shores marks where water once stood, and as levels dropped, the ghost town of St. Thomas re-emerged from beneath the surface. Human remains have been discovered, a World War II-era landing craft appeared near the marina in 2022 after spending decades hidden under 185 feet of water. The dam itself endures. Roosevelt declared it a feat that altered the geography of a whole region, and nearly 90 years later, that assessment still holds. American engineers and workers built a structure in one of the most forbidding landscapes on Earth that tamed a river, powered cities, and created what was once the largest man-made lake in the Western Hemisphere. If you found this fascinating, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next deep dive into the engineering marvels that shaped the modern world.